So we're live Hello. here with IRP5. Sorry for the technical issues that we had. We believe we've got them all worked out now. Um, and if you missed this from the earlier stream, they are a group of men who were unjustly incarcerated that were freed um, as a result of the First Step Act. And their case has even had federal judges stand up for them. They've had us advocating for their release um, and many others. And they, you know, they just so deserve freedom. And I'm so glad today that we see them here at their homes and that they're free. They're with their families or with their loved ones. Um, so we wanted to talk to them about their situation and, you know, really what, what we have in front of us going forward, how we can ensure that this is sort of um, something that people can learn from and yeah. to ensure that this doesn't happen in the future. And also to sort of figure out what we can take from their case and the injustice done here to, you know, learn and really create policy that's intelligent and legislation that's intelligent that really ensures that nobody ends up in the situation they ended up in. Um, because there should never be a case where, you know, men like this end up in the position they ended up in. When we have child rapists and child traffickers who go to prison for less time than they did mm -hmm. right. when these men were not accused of a violent crime. It was there are no victims. There are no victims. From what this is yes. these men were innocent. They had business and you know that business apparently this prosecutor decided to attack this business. You know, and it was it's honestly if you if you delve deep into their case, it's it's a lot of corruption, a lot of just uh, even in my wildest dreams, I couldn't dream up something to charge them with that's from their case. So that that's what really blows my mind. It's is pretty that unbelievable. They were, I would encourage you guys to check it out. Yeah. And um, they or who was I talking to last? Or Kendrick? Could you brief yes. everybody just um, on you know where where our viewers can go to find out information about your case? Uh, there is uh, free the irp dot com, and then there's a. Uh, there's an organization called AJC, which is, stands for A Just Cause, A-JustCause.com. That it's an advocacy organization that really, uh, uh, you know, got behind our case and other cases, but really kind of showcased uh, the injustice that happened to us as their, you know, marquee, uh, you know, stand on, as their organization went to advocate for, you know, reform in this justice system. Yeah. So, Demetrius, can you tell us why are you guys free today? Well, one of the reasons is, um, you know, we wanted that Clint was freed for the First Step Act. And we're very happy. That was a very exciting day for us as brothers and uh, men in arms together. We we fought together. We've been uh, together a long time. And on January 2nd, it was just a great day to see Clint uh, freed uh, for the uh, the first through the first step back. And, you know, that's one of the things that we've recognized is that we think we're thankful for that. Uh, and Clint's free today. We're free today uh, for uh, COVID-19. <laughs> uh, so, but we're, we're very happy about the justice initiatives that are moving forward to, to cause change. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so tell me this, David, um, you know, what do you think, David people, David, Z. David Z, David Z, what do you think people need to learn from your guys' case going forward? Well, I think what they need to see is that really anybody could end up where we were yeah. because we yeah. didn't do anything wrong. We were just running a business and the government came after us and put us in prison without even having any real charges against us. Correct. When you look at what the case was about. There was nothing there that we did wrong. We didn't commit a crime, but they were still able to put us in prison. And when you go and look at a looks, jury, looks like the jury turns around and if you're in court, you're guilty. Let's right. see if we have everybody back. And Robin, we're missing your video. I think feed. people can hear him. Mm -hmm. we, we're missing your video. Feed, it, Robin. Let's see. Yeah. Demetrius, can you hear David Z? Yes, I can hear everyone. Okay, cool. Just don't see Robbie's video. Right. Yeah. 
So, uh, David Banks, if you can, tell us, what do you think um, going into 2020, going into this election, what is it important that people know about your guys' case? Oh, there's a couple of things. One thing people have to know, the system is not what it appears to be. Uh, we were we were uh, actually developing law enforcement software for the likes of the Department of Homeland Security. Can you tell us, Demetrius, what what you think well, is important? They were talking. We, they can't hear us. Oh, okay. Yeah, they were talking. Sorry. You know what we should do? If something's messing with this stream, like something's messing with this stream, these stories need to be told. We have to get each one of them on on their own, and we'll put it up later. Yeah. I want to hear from each one of them. This well, is something that's uh, keeping us. It from looks years. like our viewers are having the other problem on this. Demetrius, you can hear me? Yes, I can hear you, David. Yeah, I can hear you fine. All too. right, we can hear you now. We just can't okay. see you, Rob. So, that's fine. <laughs> okay. We'll, we'll, we'll power through. So, tell me, you know, going into 2020, what do you think is important people know? Because from my mindset, you know, we have the option of somebody like Joe Biden who wrote the crime bill and who has not, you know, I mean, he was there before and he did nothing. You know, when you, you guys were in prison, when Obama was president, when Joe Biden was vice president and right. they did nothing for your guys' cases. Um, and there was really, there was an appetite, I think, for, for, you know, reform, but it just didn't happen. So. Right. What do you think people need to recognize going into 2020? Because in my mind, you know, you could make an argument, hey, Trump could come off kind of abrasive sometimes. He can be a little bit, you know, um, he's not always like the most eloquent with his words. Whereas <laughs> right. Obama, he was a beautiful speaker and everything, you know. Right. But with Trump, his actions and his policy, that's really what should speak to people, you know, less so than his behavior or the way he talks. Well... And I think the important thing is you give credit where credit is due. Right. Uh, Obama was sent a letter uh, from the former federal appeals judge, H. Lee Sarakin, who reviewed, who exhaustively reviewed our case and found that we were indicted and imprisoned for failing to pay corporate debt. That is what, that is what happened. Obama was aware of that uh, his uh, counsel White House counsel actually received emails from a just cause concerning the judge's letter and, and sent the personal letter. Obama didn't do anything. So as far as 2020 is concerned, people have to make a, a decision, their own personal decision. And as you say, right, uh, uh, not everybody agrees with Trump. They don't necessarily have to, but credit must be given where credit is due. That's true. And, uh, me personally, I was somewhat offended that an African American president didn't pass criminal justice reform, given the knowledge of uh, a lot of implicit racial bias that has been uh, proven to exist in the system. That's right. And another thing that really benerved me uh, with President Obama is he released uh, Chelsea Manning, who admitted to uh, releasing. Uh, thousands of pages of classified information and had the audacity to say that Chelsea Manning's having a tough time in prison. But well, we were not right. we were not having a picnic in prison by exactly. any right. nation. And I just think every person with whatever choice they need to make, they need to look uh, past uh, personality and look at exactly what uh, you're voting for and what you expect to get. And honestly, I don't expect to get much from Joe Biden, he was there during the Obama administration. He's a career politician. Right. I just I just don't expect to get much. But people have to make their own choice about what they want to do. And and I challenge them to always look past personality and see the policies that are actually being put forward. That's right. That's right. Yeah, so it's so important because right. this isn't about Trump. This is about the policy and how it's going to benefit the people. And um, I wanted to hear from you. Um, who did we not hear from? Uh, uh, Dick Kendrick, or we talked to Kendrick. Yeah, we we, talk to who's next in line? I, I, would, I would say this, though. You know, I think one of the great misunderstandings out there, and I wonder if you guys agree with this, is there was, was sort of this overarching idea that Republicans were, um, you know, let's say complicit in racism or that they were ignoring racism or whatever it is. 
I think what we're seeing today is that there's really two very different schools of thought. The Democratic Party seems to be embracing a very Marxist ideology um, right. because the organizations that they support are, are, you know, essentially Marxist, whereas the Republicans are taking very pragmatic approaches to racial bias and racial issues, whereas, you know, we've got like Tim Scott wrote a great bill to deal with some of those biases and to do police reform. But the Democrats refuse to vote for it. So instead, we have no police reform, you know, um, and beyond that, we look at issues like the First Step Act. It was a fight to get the First Step Act done. There was yeah. actually a lot, you know, of uh, pushback, you know, and Trump's working on the Second Step Act right now. And they're facing a lot of pushback on the Second Step Act as well. So, you know, I think that some of the ideas from the past about who Republicans are, have been breaking down and we're seeing more. It's really a matter of pragmatic versus radical. And um, I wonder how you guys see that, David Z. Well, when you look at it, you see yes. that there's so much politics going on, whether it's the Republicans or the Democrats, everybody's looking, well, this is going to be my thing. This is going to be my thing on the Republican side. This is going to be my thing on the Democrat side. And nothing's getting done. People have to look at what they're doing and realize that they're affecting the lives of Americans every day, and they have to make a decision to do something. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that that kind of speaks to the problem we have where so many of our representatives are so dependent on fundraising that they're not actually doing. They're not actually doing and making lives better. They're spending their time fundraising to make sure they can stay in office. And I think that's a fundamentally broken part of our system that we really need campaign finance reform and we need to make sure that people are there to do their job and not there to have to get checks for their next election. Um, because that's what's that's really what's broken us down for so long is that you don't get common sense things like this done um, to free men like you guys who did nothing wrong mm -hmm. unless people are doing their job. And the fact it took this long to do it is sort of it, honestly, I think it's an embarrassment to our country because we're better than that. Um, well, and I do I do believe we're better than that, you know, and I know for you guys, I wouldn't begrudge you guys thinking that maybe we're not because you guys are the ones who had to sit in prison waiting and losing your family and everything. But deep down, I think that Americans are better than this and that issues like this should have been done a long time ago. Um, do you, how do you guys feel about that? Hey, Robbie, can I say something? This is David Banks. Yeah. Um, it is important to realize, and when I said Trump signed the First Step Act, a lot of people want to make the case that it was... Uh, it was bipartisan legislation, yeah, but everybody has to come involved. He takes a lot of criticism for a lot of things, but we give credit where credit was due. He signed into law the First Step Act, right? and his administration pushed hard, specifically Jared Kushner, to get the First Step Act passed. Right. And it's vitally important that uh, politics aside, I'm not a fan of politics. The only thing, uh, one of the big attractions to Trump was he's not a politician. Whether you like him or hate him, uh, or like him or dislike him, he's not a politician. And I think uh, a lot of the society is sick and tired of politics as usual. And that's that's where the rubber really meets the road is, what is he going to do? It's, it's, you got to cut through politics sometimes, unfortunately, because Absolutely. what I've seen in the past is, even before Trump, was people just kicking the can down the road. Sometimes uh, right. uh, perilous... These type of challenges, you gotta you gotta challenge and you gotta do something right. different. And I think that's what President Trump did was something different. Uh, even though a lot of people didn't like what he did, some of the policies were good. And nobody's gonna agree with everybody on everything, but uh, right. you you got a choice. Uh, who do you want uh, at this particular point? People have to sit down and really make an informed decision and don't listen to everything the media is saying because. Honestly, I quit watching news, mainstream media news, because all it is is editorializing and op-eds. I just want to hear the news, right. and I can hear President Trump for myself. I can make a decision about his conduct. I can hear Joe Biden, and I can make that decision on my own. I don't need the media trying to massage uh, their opinions uh, into my brain. Yeah, 100%. And if you know, I would also like to add, too, that it's the 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 African American vote has been taken for granted as a as a, a as a, a guarantee to the Democratic Party. 
And to me, I think that each American should look at who's going to give results to my daily life. Who, what affects me? Because it shouldn't just be I'm choosing a side. You have to, to see what got done. And what I did, what I do like about the Trump administration is he, it wasn't the status quo. Right. The status quo is what kept us in prison. It's what put us in prison. Right. Because they tell you, follow you know, the formula. If you go to appeals and you have evidence proving your innocence, you go to court with evidence proving your innocence that the right thing happens. And that's not true. We, right. we live, but to see that Trump went around on a lot of ways and, and did what was right in the criminal justice reform mm -hmm. and he did what was right with the COVID-19 because a lot of people's health was it was in jeopardy and they and the administration did do the right things. And that's the that's what I would encourage anyone that's voting, no matter what your political leanings are. Do something that's going to get you results as a citizen that's going to change and make it better for all of us. Not just, you know, choose a side left or right and say, that's how I'm going to vote. It has to be something that's going to make changes and matters in the end. That's right. Absolutely. I think that's you guys are bringing up such brilliant points there because I think that has to be reframed for people. You know, This is one of the biggest lies that the media has sold us, this partisan politics. Pick a side. You don't, you know, follow your heart, follow your values yeah. and, and that clear road of these these policies. You know, nobody wants to see this happen to to anybody in their family. Um, and I really feel like it's important. I know we touched on this in the first stream before things got messed up, but I really want to touch on the humanity aspect of this. Y'all, I'm sure all have um, families. Um, I don't know if some of y'all have children, but what can you say to the, the other victims in, in this injustice? You know, what I know, I don't want to put anybody on the spot, you know, sharing personal um, things you're not comfortable with. But I think that people need to understand the hu human toll that this takes on families, um, that it takes a father out of the home. It takes a yes. mother out of the home. It, it puts a mother in horrible, you know, strengths, having to raise children, um, what it does to children. Who, who, who would like to you know, share a personal experience maybe about that? Demetrius has kids. And so do I and Clint. Well, I was first to say my daughter. Well, oh, go ahead, Demetrius. <laughs> that was Clint, wasn't it? Yeah, Clint. I, I uh, single single dad. Uh, my daughter was in high school. She was 17 years old. You know, any anyone raising a high school uh, kid knows there's a lot of pressure from the teachers. Uh, the supplies that you got to get for school. You got to watch the kids keep up their grades. Kids are always trying to get away with, with, with something. You know, you, you got to keep your grades up, you know, and uh, it's very tough to go through an indictment, uh, you know, through the years. It was years that we, since we got rated, we got rated in the year 2005, got an indictment in 2009. We went to court in 2011. So you have six years there that the government is uh, draining you of all your resources, putting pressure on you as a parent, as a defendant to defend yourself. And here you are raising your kid uh, in high school and beyond and getting them prepared in this sort of very strained uh, environment. And certainly when you go to prison, you know, all of your resources are exhausted. Now you gotta have money put on your books uh, you got to have money for various things, looking out for your kid. Who's going to take care of my kid? I'm a single parent. You know, I mean, I, I don't know what I would do without our church family there to, uh, you know, step in right. and, and make sure that my daughter is OK. You know, uh, thank God that she turned out just fine. She turned out, uh, you know, I mean, it, it, it's a beautiful, uh, beautiful story about her. Uh, that she turned out she's in her career now and, and so forth in college and et cetera. But it's a real strain when the government purposely puts you through this situation. They'll raid the, the, the company for this, uh, the, the grand jury situation. They raided it to get evidence, so-called. Then they waited four whole years before they went for an indictment. They got the indictment. And then another two years for the case to actually go to court and you, you go to court to defend yourself. So you got uh, six years there where they're milking the situation, draining you of your resources. And all of that's done on purpose to make sure that you feel the pressure 
of their power to get you to capitulate and ask for a plea deal or whatever. All this time you're going through as a single parent and all of your resources are depleted. And with my daughter, uh, it was it was very tragic. The day after, uh, the week after I went in prison, she went to church, she stood up to testify. It was actually on Father's Day. And the next Father's Day after I went to prison and literally broke down in church and had the entire congregation weeping from the pain that she was feeling. Uh, the day I was being shackled and taken and unjustly taken off to taken off to prison, uh, she was trying to call me and say she got accepted to the University of Colorado. And my uh, sister had to tell me, pass a message to me that she was excited and uh, happy about getting accepted to the university. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, the status quo, as Ken said, dominated. Uh, Trump is not a status quo president and the status quo put us in prison. Right. It would have kept us in prison uh, for And we really need people, Absolutely. somebody that's going to buck the status quo that's for true. the benefit of all Americans. Make no mistake. Uh, the justice system, I've heard it said by President Trump, is to give credit where credit is due. It is rigged. If you right. don't have billions of dollars, that's right. make no mistake, you're going to prison and the government will cheat you out of a fair trial. They will violate your constitutional rights. That's right. Irrespective of your children, they don't care about Absolutely. your children. They don't care about your livelihood. It's just, it's it's a machine that, that, that just, you get on the conveyor belt and they just roll you right into prison without passion, without prejudice, right. without compassion. That's the way the system works. And the pain to my, my daughter, That's my right. mother, my sisters, uh, I don't think it can be it can be can't be adequate, adequately understated when people just they're just sitting there and they just years later they just sit up and start crying because you're still incarcerated. They don't even know why they're crying, but right. they just start crying. The the emotions and the and the human toll and human damage cannot be under us understated. Right. And Robbie, I'm uh, this is Demetrius. I have uh, two children and and Clint and David bring up key points that I can't. The, the pain and the, the, the sense of loss, you know, in the African-American community, there are so many uh, uh, households with without a dad, without a father. And yeah. that's what the government yeah. did to us. Uh, we were successful African-Americans uh, in the IT field and successful uh, African-Americans as businessmen. And we 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 believe that the American dream is for all. And that's why we went down this path to create a revolutionary software for our law enforcement uh, uh, community. And for the toll that it has on the children, our wives, our family is cannot be understated uh, to be shackled away, as David had said, in front of your family with no, um, no care or, or, or anything for our family, what that's like. And to know that we're innocent, I guess that's what makes it very... Uh, during that time, very difficult to deal, deal with that we knew that we did nothing wrong and people on the outside as well stating the same facts that there's this is a debt case and yes. you had an overzealous prosecutor that yeah. just was hell bent on putting us in prison and a judge that uh, just violated our rights, as David had mentioned earlier. So to have our right. family go through this was very difficult, but I'm thankful that we stuck together. We were uh, unified and and that's what brought us through yes. a lot of prayers and a lot of support. And what we learned in prison, a lot of people don't have that. And that's what's unfortunate. When they put you in prison, right. they shut right. you off from Absolutely. the world. So we're just thankful that we did have a family. We came back and uh, and we're just moving forward. Robbie, you still there? Look like you might've dropped out. Still alive. Robbie? Yeah, you hear us? Yes. Yep. Just now. Oh, okay. So I wanna remind people that it's not just that there's, you know, court cases and appearances you have to make. 
This is missed basketball games. It's missed family dinners. It's it's First all of right. those things that really make life matter. So even before you had to go to prison, you were already in a sort of prison of its own where you had to have that exactly. worry on your mind all the time in the back of your head. And exactly. you look at your kids and you think about, am I going to be with them next week? Am I going to be with them the week after? Right. You know, and you don't right. know. It's the not knowing that I think would, would, you know, somebody who's never been to prison, that is what would drive me the most crazy is the not knowing, you know, what right. is going to right. happen and knowing that I couldn't be there to save or defend my child if I were in prison and something happened to them while I was there. So from that aspect, I just, I commend you guys as men because you guys don't look like you want revenge. You look like you just want your lives back and you want right. to have a happy life with your kids and, and right. you know, have the promises and dreams that this country is supposed to provide to people. And I believe in our country to be able to do that. I believe in people like you guys and people like us to be able to work together and make it happen. Um, but, you know, we definitely need to acknowledge those changes that need to be made in our system. And I, I think David Banks hit it right on, on the head when he said, you know, the status quo is what does not work. What is not right. working for any right. of us is the status quo. That's and, true. Um, exactly. You know, as somebody, I had a very cushy job in Hollywood um, as a director. And I could have kept doing that, making really great money and keeping my mouth shut about, you know, all this stuff. And if, I probably would have been better off for it in a personal sense. <laughs> but in a in the sense as a father, having three kids, I wanted to be able to look my kids in the eye a couple decades from now and be able to tell them I did everything I could to make our country a better place and to That's really fight for the stuff that I believe in instead of just, you know, having a PR person make statements that are the right statement that you're supposed to make. I wanted to be real about this type of stuff. So um you know, I think right. people need to be unafraid of opening their, their mouths and, and don't be silent. Don't worry about the, you know, outcome there, because the only way we're going to change is by changing the status quo. And um, to change the status quo, we need to get rid of some people from office, you know, and you do need to vote. And I think that um, I feel the same way David Banks does, that Trump represented that sort of um, fight back against the, the status quo. And Trump has sort of acted as, as a fighter yeah. against the status quo. And, um, you know, right. one of the things that bothers me the most is that, you know, you were talking about the media, David, and you were saying, you know, the media, they're, they're editorializing now. They're not just providing the news. Yeah. And, you know, I think that that's, that's so true when it comes to President Trump, because a large part of the American psyche that doesn't like him is dependent on anonymous sources. So a lot of the stuff people thinks that he said or done are not things that you can actually watch a video or see audio of him saying or doing. They're simply right. things that some media outlet got an anonymous source to say he did, which is sort of a new phenomenon because, um, you know, right. they've used anonymous sourcing in the past, but the way they used it in the past was you had to have three anonymous sources. They were all equally vetted separately. And now it's just, we'll take a single unnamed source and right. pretend that whatever they say is the gospel, as long as it is saying that Trump is bad. And so you have all these things right. you know, people say they think he's done. But in Joe Biden's case, we know what he said and done because it's on video. He said on video that he didn't want his kids going to a school with black kids in what he called the racial jungle. He was right. against the de he was against the desegregation of schools and busing, you know, black children from poor areas into what were traditionally white schools. These are things we know that he did. You know, we, bill, right. we, and, and the crime yeah. bill, right? And the crime, what, what piece of legislation has taken more black fathers out of the home than the crime bill? Right. I, there isn't one. More black fathers have been taken out of the home by the crime bill than anything else. It's been the most destructive force for black families and the nuclear family and American greatness, to be frank, in total, not just in the black community, but totally because having black, strong black fathers in the home would make our entire country a better place. Absolutely. It was the most destructive piece of legislation in decades, and he wrote right. it. So that's something that in my mind, I'm just sort of mind boggled that he's even he's even an option because I think that his history was just so destructive. And for him to run mm -hmm. as if he is the champion of, of Black America is even more of a slap in the face in my mind because Absolutely. essentially saying that, you know what, I did mm -hmm. all these things to Black people, this but you guys are still going to vote for me. You right. know, do you feel the same way? 
Yeah, and this is Dave Banks. In many ways, uh, we do feel some of the similar ways. It's it's the champion for dependency. I don't dependency doesn't be, benefit anybody. I just feel like anybody who wants African Americans dependent on the government, we don't want to be. No, no person wants to deal with that sort of dependency uh, from a a large federal government that is so far from the the source of your need and the source of your pain uh a bigger government just doesn't get it done when it comes to uh really helping and being effective for people and it, it, it was evident in the in the system that the system is like the, their, the conscience of the system has been has been seared uh for instance uh i had an opportunity i had actually a sister that died from the stress of us being in prison I tried to use use the government system uh, to just ask to go home for a few days to her funeral, and they turned me down. And I'm sitting at a nonviolent camp with no fences, no walls, and I can't go home to grieve my sister's death. Certainly, uh, that's the status quo. That's Certainly, right. if, if I could have gotten probably to President Trump, he could have approved me to just go home for a few days to see my family to, uh, and, and buck the status quo. So yeah. it's that sort of pain and stress right. that this large government system and the status quo constantly brings more pain than good to the lives of a lot of That's Americans. Right. <laughs> and one of the things with what so David true. was saying is it is the prison's policy to allow you to go home. You're supposed right. to be able to furlough for something like that. And they wouldn't let him go. That's right. That's right. And they even contacted the prosecutor and the prosecutor said, don't let him go. Well, why, why is it his decision? Exactly. It, but right. This is what you exactly. deal with. Somebody has to, and that's one of the positive things about Trump is to attack the status quo, attack uh, career politicians that have been in uh, Washington for 30 and 40 years kicking the can down the road and not doing much uh, for the American people in general. Now, a lot of people will say, well, every president takes credit for the economy. Well, if, if President Trump got it down to 3.5%, or then he has to get credit. You got to give credit where credit is due. Uh, another president would take credit. Give credit where credit is due. You can criticize where you feel criticism is necessary, but give credit. And I don't see enough of that being done with the mainstream media. Right. If, if there's no credit, Absolutely. there's no incentive to, to support this continuation. You know, we, we need more uh, justice being served. If we don't acknowledge it. It's not going to who are we encouraging to make it happen for the rest of the people that are still locked up? That's right. That's right. Yeah. Let me let me uh, uh, bring your mind to a statement that was uh, made by Joe Biden fairly recently, probably about six weeks ago. He said, uh, if you vote for Trump over me, you're not really black. Mm -hmm. Well, I take offense to that. Trump is the one that got the uh, First Step Act done. And Obama uh, responded to my daughter's letter. She, she wrote a letter to him, two letters to him. And he responded to her letter via email, suggesting that I was guilty that I have to do my time. That was his response. But when I got out on the First Step Act was something, an action that, you know, uh, you know, both sides of the aisles or whatever, you know, Congress has passed legislation that the president signed, President Trump. I thank President Trump for that. And, uh, you know, when Joe Biden says, if you vote for Trump over me, you're not black. Well, I, I, I take offense to that because the president, when you were vice president, not only did he have the opportunity to pardon us and to let us let us out of prison before we got convicted. While this thing was going on, we appealed to President Obama that he could have told his uh, uh, U.S. attorney, assistant right. U.S. attorney, stand down. I see the case. These guys are are are. It's not likely that these guys are are guilty. You know, leave that alone. Uh, let the let the evidence speak for itself. Let their proffer stand. Dump, you know, uh, drop drop this case. He could have did all that, but he did nothing. He let Chelsea Manning out of prison, and that's his that's his answer to prison reform: is let this uh, let this 
this this this white guy who who had a sex change out of prison because he's having a hard time. Whereas our case, he answered my daughter and said, "Well, your dad's got to do his time in prison." So um, I don't want to hear this. Uh, you're not black enough stuff. Right. It's it's divisive and it's destructive, and I think that's you know basically what the Democratic platform is now. It's um, insulting. Yeah, absolutely. It's very um, insulting. What what can you guys? I mean, I want to educate people. This is an opportunity to get people to support. Um, what policy changes? You know, what would you like to see happen in the Second Step Act, and how can we be more supportive of that? Like, can you specific? You know, you guys have an insight from from doing the, this time. What on the inside needs to change? What policies need to change? What needs to be added to the Second Step Act? We want to listen I, to this. I would say. Uh, First off is that there has to be some mechanism that prosecutors and judges are held accountable when they don't follow the law that they're saying that I have to follow. Right. And that's uh, the biggest point is there are so many things that were done uh, against the Constitution, which is basically illegal, that were you know allowed to happen. And there's no fear of once you exhaust your appeals. There is nothing else you can do as an American to say, hey, you know what? Right. There's a wrong here. Right. How do we correct this? So, so there has to be some uh, uh, teeth in the laws, the, any new law that comes out that says, you know what? Not only, If you're going to take a man's freedom away from him, take him from his family, take him from his livelihood, and you do that without any consideration of was this trial done fairly? Was it done justly? Then there should be some sort of, of you know, repercussions That's that actually right. go the other way, you know, because if I break the law, it affects me. I'm, I'm penalized by that. But how can you be above the law in this system? Then there's no way real justice right. if there's a section of society that's above the law. That's right. And, and I would advocate Dave, Dave Banks. Uh, prison camps are the most useless uh, institution uh ever there's absolutely nothing going on in a prison camp that's men right. are being warehoused that is the nature of the united states prison right. system. camps if you can't the only thing should be available is work camps where guys can go out and pay their taxes and do whatever uh the current status of camps right now is a bunch of guys walking around doing absolutely nothing that's right uh the bop <laughs> claimed the bop that's claims true. are giving three three uh Three nutritious meals a day, that's not true. Everything no. is is just simply not true. And so it's a it's it's a barren wasteland for uh productivity, for rehabilitation. There is nothing positive about prison camps, and there's no fences, no walls, no bars, nothing's there except a bunch of uh people walking around doing nothing. Well, I'm walking the track today, I'm watching TV. And honestly, uh, the education, they have an education system, but it's absolutely ridiculous. They're actually trading that's tools right. uh, <laughs> and signing off on educational <laughs> Exactly. And that's the, that's that's the right. currency of the prison. It's just absolutely outrageous. It's but true. that's, that's right. the, if I was to recommend something, something needs to be done with prison camps. I believe that if a person worked his way down to camp level points, because the prison system operates on a point system. So if you're at a medium and you work your way down to a camp, I think people should work their way down either to a halfway house or a home confinement and completely eradicate prison camps because they serve no useful purpose. And they're taking tax dollars too, by the way. Yeah. yeah. And and to David's point, uh, <clears throat> while we were in prison, uh, he wrote uh, a, a very uh, exhaustive piece on the cost of to imprison an inmate. And how much that, that does cost the American people? Uh, couldn't a prisoner that uh, has worked his way down, or she's worked herself down to a camp, be more useful as a worker and paying taxes to help the economy? You have a certain number of people, uh, and again, I don't have the statistics in front of me, but there are a lot of campers, both male and female, that can be back into the uh, working environment and pr producing a, another uh, a, a tax. Uh, to help with our taxes and and david's point on the food there is atrocious and i think we need to as a country look at other countries how they incarcerate and what successes they have and i think 
the American, the status quo, as we mentioned, has been so uh, uh, resistant to how other people in the European That's system, right. and some of the Scandinavian systems where they have a low recidivism rate, as well as they don't have the violence that we have here in America. And I think we need right. to take a good look at how others are doing it and what worked for them and implement those changes in our uh, justice system. At least I'll, say, I'll say this, you know, I really think that we need to differentiate in our system mm -hmm. much, much more between violent and nonviolent criminals. Oh, right. We, yeah. we are right. fusing together people who are violent, violent, violent people That's true. who should should not have the same access, you know, say if you're a rapist and a murderer, you shouldn't no, have absolutely. the same access as somebody true. like you guys. Um, and right. you should have better programs for people like you guys than you do somebody who is going to spend the rest of their life, you know, mm -hmm. on death row, essentially, if they're, you know, it, we're just, we're not for differentiating what, for, for people white, enough. For people accused of white collar crimes, yeah. you know, that kind of financial things, not obviously you guys didn't deserve to even be there in the first place, but there are a lot of people that have, there's white collar crimes going on. And, you know, we have to have that discussion. Is, is it really uh, productive, you know, to re rehabilitate somebody who doesn't need rehabilitation? Yeah. Well, right. or is it right. more productive if somebody, let's say, commits tax fraud, you know, and they, they owe the government, you know, a, a $200,000. Is it more productive to put them in prison for five years with a bunch of violent criminals? Or is it more productive to make them work and mm -hmm. have a job and have their, right. you know, part of their paycheck going exactly. back to paying back the American yeah. people. Yeah. I exactly. think that's right. really, that's going to teach them the lesson is seeing that money gone every week from their paycheck if they're nonviolent and it's a white collar mm -hmm. crime. Now, when you get into the violent crimes and crimes against children, I'm much more firm on, on their needing to be, you know, uh, real agree. harsh right. consequences. Agree. But right. On nonviolent crime, we really need to rethink how we go about this in America because what you guys went through is something that I will never forget and it will always be in the back of my mind. I am going to run for office one day and it will always be in the back of my mind how you guys were treated. Hey, Robbie, let, let, me, say, let me say something to you real quick, Robbie. It's, it, it's, not, it's not only us. We, there was a guy, the culture in this country, country is that people have to go to prison for – and they're a felon, and there's a, there's a stigma that, that sticks with you the rest of your life. That's why we're going to continue to fight to clear our name. There was a guy put in prison for six months, and these stories are wide and, and, and uh, ubiquitous throughout the system. Is yeah. There was a guy put in for taking a rock off federal land. They were going to give him three years in prison if he didn't take a plea deal. So he said, goes to prison. He returns the rock. He didn't know it was illegal to take a rock off federal land. But the prosecutor put him in prison. Right. Uh, the yeah, U.S. Attorney's crazy. Office. It, it's crazy. And and but there's this culture like, well, you got got to lock them up. They just have to serve some prison time. Not everybody has to serve prison time. Right. There are guys out there that are that are just drug users. Uh, but the widespread uh, conspiracy law gathers everybody up. Uh, you don't know that half of these drug dealers. They're low level low level guys selling stuff on the street. They don't know the guy that's up there right. distributing at, at, at the high right. level. They get all put into the same boat. And some of them get, you get some of those guys serving 10 years in prison, and they didn't even know, know where uh, half the other guys in the conspiracy or any of the other guys in the conspiracy. This is how a lot of this stuff, then you go there, guys are continuously using drugs. Don't make no mistake, drugs are in prison. So you're not doing anything to uh, stop these guys and their bad drug habits because there is no rehabilitation. It's a very sick, unforgiving system right. uh, and very uncompassionate system. It, yeah, that's right. That's just what the system is. And some ch major changes have got to be made for nonviolent offenses uh, across the board. That's true. Uh, and that, that, that is a key to many other countries. They don't lock up nonviolent offenders. This country has got to take its uh, view on on nonviolent prisoners and change that view all the way around if they're going to be successful. And the American people need to accept the fact that a bad choice by some to break the law, everybody makes bad choices. Right. Why do you feel like everybody right. who makes a bad choice against the law needs to be put in prison when people are making bad choices all over the country uh, not necessarily associated with the law. We all make bad choices, 
and we all have made bad choices in our life. You don't need a system that feels like it needs to lock everybody up right. uh, for every bad choice. Or so a felon, well, what is a felon? Well, a felon made is someone who probably made a bad choice. He didn't kill anybody. He didn't rape a, a woman. He didn't rape a small child. Uh, you have a lot of people that don't fit into those type of categories that should get a, a little more leniency from this system and don't. And there's really no need to lock them up. And there needs to be some sort of sentencing right. reform when it comes to this. If it's a first time nonviolent offense, there should not be somebody that's getting 10 years for something like that. Right. Each of us got 10 or 11 years and it was a nonviolent first time offense and nobody had been in trouble before. Right. That's that's just that's not that should never happen in, in our Correct. system with the I mean, your your guys, whole case should never happen in our system exactly. at all. You could even Correct. make the argument like if somebody right. out there believes you guys did this and that it's a crime. Even then, under those circumstances, you guys still shouldn't go to prison. Yeah. That's still that's not how you would even rectify any suggested bad behavior in the first place. When it's it, this is about a business, it's about right. a business. It's not you guys didn't violate a person. You guys didn't harm anybody. There was there was nothing. I mean, it just blows my mind. It really does. Because you guys, in the first place, there was nothing you should have been charged for in the first place. But I'm just trying to operate from the mindset of somebody who thinks that there's a crime there, even from right. their mind. I don't yeah. understand how they could think that the way to fix it is prison. But I just I thank you guys so much for coming on our show and sharing your story. Um, you guys will always be in my mind and in our hearts. And we just hope that your guys' families and you guys get to make up on all that love you guys missed while you were gone. And that people learn from this and that, you know, um, we see real change. And and I am I'm very happy to see the change that has occurred. But, you know, we're excited to see where this goes yeah, and that we right. can get to a place where still so much to, to there's more yeah, to do. So much so to do. Yeah, clearing, our, clearing our name is, is top of our list because our name shouldn't have to be uh, sullied to such a point. Uh, after after this uh, unjust conviction. So I thank you so yeah. much, Robbie, thank you. for having thank us you, on. Thank you, Robbie. Thank you, Landon. Thank you so Absolutely. much, Thank you, thank thank you, you Landon. guys. We'll talk to you All guys right. soon. Right. Take care. Yeah, thank All you all right. for watching. Make sure you like, right. subscribe, thank you. subscribe, and um, check out the, the guys' stories. They have an incredible story, and um, it's really worth digging into. Thank you, guys.